Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. I would like to thank each and everyone of you for being here with us at live session from Masa University, Sarjana Putra Campus. I am Muhammad Al Kausa bin Harun. I am from Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University, and I will be moderating today's session. Today's webinar, Physiotherapy Management for Diabetes Complication, is proudly organized by Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University. Dear viewers, before we proceed further, I would like to give you a brief overview of the programs offered by Faculty of Health Sciences at Masa University. Okay, Faculty of Health Sciences houses three departments, School of Physiotherapy, Department of Environmental Health, and Department of Medical Imaging. Under School of Physiotherapy, we have Diploma in Physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy ODL, and Master of Physiotherapy. <coughs> Under Department of Environmental Health, we have Diploma in Environmental Health, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety ODL, and Diploma in Occupational Safety and Health. Under Department of Medical Imaging, we got Diploma in Medical Imaging, Bachelor of Medical Imaging, and Bachelor of Medical Imaging ODL. Okay, why join Health Sciences? So the first one, low risk of job redundancy, opportunity to work in variety of setting, a career you can feel good about, lucrative remuner remunerations, <coughs> no boring work routine, and high job demand because we are essential service. Okay, for physiotherapy, we got one year program for full time and two year program for part time. And these are the entry requirement. So under bachelor program, we have bachelor of physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy ODL, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety ODL, Bachelor of Medical Imaging, and Bachelor of Medical Imaging Open and Distant Learning, which means ODL. So these are the entry requirements. So under Diploma Program, we have Diploma in Physiotherapy, Diploma in Environmental Health, and Diploma in Medical Imaging. So these are the entry requirement <coughs> for diploma in occupation therapy, uh, occupation safety and health, uh, which is a three-year program. And these are the entry requirement. <coughs> okay, why choose Faculty of Health Science, Masa University? Okay, teaching and learning. Uh, so yeah, okay, interactive teaching and emphasis on on hands-on clinical skill. We got face-to-face -face and online platform, which is LMS, white list of hospital or institution for clinical and industrial placement, accredited by MQA and GPA with international recognition, world award with ARU, cross teaching by expert. Masa has the most number of health disciplines in a single institution among IPTS, various study modes, which is <coughs> conventional and ODL and experience educated international pool of academic staff. So here are some of the master scholarship. We got Haji Abdullah Academic Excellence Scholarship, Foundation Scholarship, and many more. So here are some of the collaboration with Masa University. We collaborate with uh, World Conference for Physiotherapy, uh, MPA, which is uh, Medicine Physiotherapy Association, and many more. Okay, here regarding our <coughs> student mobility program, which is actually our student exchange program. So we got a uh, student mobility program with Hero Social University, Lovely Professional University, and Universitas Sriwijaya. We welcome you to join us. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, 
please contact us through Masa website or through our faculty Facebook page to know more about our programs. Or simply leave a comment, we will get back to you. Your question concerning this webinar session can be listed in the chat box. <coughs> right now, I will give a, a brief introduction about our webinar. Actually, it's uh, regarding diabetes. So, diabetes mellitus is a complex illness that requires thorough medical care through mis multidisciplinary approach beyond blood sugar level control. There are a variety of measures diabetic patients can take to control this condition. Engaging in exercise is one of the effective non-pharmacological and non-invasive approach to manage and or prevent diabetes and its complication. <clears throat> okay, right now uh, I will give some introduction regarding our speaker. Uh, his name is Muhammad Hafiz bin Abu Suman. Uh, Mr. Hafiz holds Bachelor of Physiotherapy from International Islamic University, Malaysia, IIUM, and Master of Clinical Exercise Science from Uni University Science, Malaysia, USM. Currently, he is working as a lecturer at UITM, Chawangan Pulau Pinang, Kampus Petang. Okay, Mr. Hafiz, the screen is all yours. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Alkota for such a great introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to all of you. Hope uh, all of you in the ping of health and always stay healthy. All right, without further delay, let's have a session for today. I'm Omar Hafiz, and today I will share about physiotherapy uh, or exercise therapy for diabetes complications. Here are the outline or content summary for today. I will go for introduction. Basically, uh, we go about the prevalence of the diabetes, intro, uh, meaning and also definitions of the diabetes, and a little bit about the uh, diagnostic value of diabetes. And then uh, we'll go further for complication of diabetes because of this complication, we as a physiotherapy and exercise therapy want to tackle that complication of diabetes mellitus. If then, after we all know all the complications, then we go for physiotherapy and also exercise intervention management, which uh, comprise of the pain management, aerobic training, weight bearing exercise. Does it say because previously, traditionally, uh, people with diabetes mellitus does not encourage to do weight bearing exercise, but now, how? Uh, we will go further for that, and then we go for balance and get training strategies flexibility exercise, and also strength training approach. To that, we go for conclusions. As for introduction, diabetes has become one of the largest global healthcare problem of the 21st century. It is a serious long-term condition with major impact on the life and also well-being of the individuals, family, and societies worldwide. And diabetes mellitus is very threatening because it leads to top 10 causes of death in adults and also estimated to have causes of 4 million deaths globally in 2017. That was very huge in numbers. Now we go for diabetes uh, prevalent estimation according to International Diabetes Federation. It is estimated that 463 million or 9.3% of total uh, world population were having diabetes, uh, usually adults aged 20 to 79 years old. And this number further rise to 10.2%, which is 578 million 
people living with diabetes in 2030. If there is no active action or prevention taken, this number will further rise to 700 million, which is 10.9% of the total whole population will be having diabetes. That's a lot. So how about Malaysia? So what do you think about Malaysia? According to National Health and Mobility Surveys 2019, one out of five Malaysian adults actually living with diabetes. And this comprised about 3.9 million people aged 19 and above were having diabetes. Uh, and that showed the trend. The diabetes trend from 2019 to 2011 to 2019 shows an increasing trend. But the most um, uh, sadly is because uh, people in Malaysia usually they don't know that they have diabetes. You can see the blue line from 2000, 2011 to 2019. There is about double of the number of the prevalence for diabetes and they don't know actually they have diabetes. Uh, as we compare uh, of diabetes between each groups, uh, the highest number usually are uh, age 60 and above, but uh, the number of um, diabetes among a uh, younger age also is getting higher. When we compare across states, Negeri Milan was found to have the highest prevalence of diabetes, followed by Perlis and Pahang with 25.7%. The prevalence is very high, so what is mean actually by diabetes? Diabetes is a group of metabolic disease in which the person has high blood glucose or blood sugar. In easy words, there is high sugar in your blood. We have three types of diabetes. Number one is type one diabetes mentis. There is inadequate insulin production, meaning uh, pancreas didn't produce in a, uh, enough insulin to use by our body. Uh, usually found in uh, children and also younger adults. Type two diabetes is usually comprised of 90% uh, of the total uh, diabetes, it is insulin resistant. There is uh, enough insulin, but the body cannot use it. And then the last one is gestational diabetes mellitus or GTM. It is high blood sugar during pregnancy. All right. As you can see the moving picture showing the reading of the blood sugar level is 9.5. So 9.5 is considered diabetes or not? We still don't know. We will uh, discuss after this. Now we will discuss about diagnostic value for diabetes. If it is fasting blood sugar, uh, usually fasting blood sugar is taken 8 to 12 hours or overnight fasting. Water intake is allowed during this fasting period. Healthy individual will expect to uh, its blood level to increase during uh, fasting, but it will return normal uh, by the insulin no insulin hormone. A diabetic patient usually will have a problem rebalance the glucose, causing blood glucose remain high. Fasting blood glucose above seven point zero millimol per liter is considered having diabetes type 2, all right? And then we go for random blood sugar. This test measures blood sugar level at a random, meaning any time of the day, regardless of the diet taken. And the normal range basically between 7 to 11.1 millimole per liter. If the number is high than 11.1, then it is considered diabetes. Other than that, we also have OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, that uh, patient after the fasting uh, blood glucose, patient will be given uh, glucose and then further measured two hours after the uh, glucose intake. 
If the number is higher than 11.1 millimole per liter, the patient is having diabetes. And the last diagnostic value for diabetes is uh, using HbA1c. If the value is more than 6.3% or more than 45 millimole per liter, that patient is having diabetes mellitus. So uh, what are the symptoms or complications of the diabetes? We can have uh, two types of complications. We have acute complications and also uh, chronic complications. Acute complication comprise of hypoglycemia. Usually, uh, symptom of hypoglycemia, patient may have fatigue, pale skin, sweating, hunger, confused, or even worse, patient can have painting. And then for acute complication also, when uh, hyperglycemia states, for example, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is actually an emergency state where patient may have uh, fast or deep breathing, dry skin and mouth, flushed face, uh, headache, and also muscle stiffness and aching. Number two is hyperosmolar glycemic syndrome, where a serious condition of the diabetes also, when uh, the, the level of sugar is too high for a long period of time, so the patient may have severe dehydration and also confusion. The next complication is chronic complications. Uh, we can have also macrovascular and microvascular. Macrovascular, for example, cardiovascular disease. Diabetes may cause risk of getting cardiovascular disease, for example, a coronary artery disease or even heart attack. And then cerebrovascular, uh, diabetes may have high risk to get things, a stroke also, and also peripheral vascular disease where a constriction of the blood vessels in the peripheral. For the microvascular, we have retinopathy. Diabetes may, may causing damage uh, to your eyes, nephropathy, damage of the kidney, and also neuropathy, damage of the uh, nerve. And today, for today's session, we will go further specifically complication for peripheral neuropathy. So what is mean by diabetic peripheral neuropathy? Uh, according to Toronto Consensus Panel on Diabetic Neuropathy, it is a symmetrical length-dependent sensorimeter, only neuropathy attributable to the metabolic and also microvessel alteration as a result of chronic hyperglycemia exposure and also cardiovascular risk covariates. It is a common chronic complication of diabetes. Uh, usually it's very challenging for the clinician and also for us as a physiotherapy and also for a clinical exercise physiologist. Diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy is leading cause of disability usually because of the foot acceleration, amputation, gait disturbance and also fall related injury. And this disability definitely will lower the quality of life and substantially increase health costs associated with the diabetes. We know about diabetes, uh, peripheral neuropathy. So what are the symptoms associated with the diabetes, peripheral neuropathy? Of course, number one, patient may have pain or unpleasant feeling, usually at the legs or foot. This pain it actually can be undescribable type of pain, right? And then number two is paresthesia. It refers to burning or prickling sensation that is usually felt in the hand, arms, leg, or feet. Uh, number three is allodynia. Uh, allodynia is also a type of pain. Uh, usually pay, uh, people with allodynia are extremely uh, sensitive to touch. For example, uh, for example, usually the activity do not causing uh, any pain. For example, combing one's hair can cause severe pain. Severe pain. Next is reduced thermal sensation and also 
uh, reduce uh, or loss of pain print sensation. And the next one is bad shit or soft intolerant, more or less is uh, related with the allodynia. And last but not least is restless leg syndrome, where a condition that causes an uncontrolled urge to move the legs, usually because an uncontrolled condition. And this is actually happen in the morning or the night time uh, while you are lying or sitting. And what to do? Just moving will ease the unpleasant feeling temporarily. So we know about diabetes already. We know all the complication now. Let's rock the diabetes. So we we'll go for pain management first. There are few modalities actually can tackle uh, for the pain management in the diabetic peripheral neuropathy. We will go for TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Um, how is it work to reduce the pain? Uh, basically, TENS will reduce uh, pain in the diabetic neuropathy by altering the non insertive transmission of the dorsal horn uh, of the spinal cord. So the mechanism includes stimulation to be delivered to the spinal cord. Uh, that further innovates the painful area and reduce the pain. The second modality can be used is low-level laser therapy. Uh, the possible explanatory factor for the reduction of pain uh, is actually due to uh, increased microcirculation to the periphery. And the mechanism involved is that this uh, low-level laser therapy will stimulate release of cytokines and also growth factor. Uh, into the circulation, which is responsible for the vessel dilation of the vessels and also formation of new capillaries. So it's promote healing also. Next is mirror therapy. Mirror therapy is one of the modality used uh, to create a reflective illusion of an affected limb in order to trick the brain into a thinking movement has occurred without pain or to create a positive visual feedback of a limb movement. Next is monochromatic infrared photo energy. Uh, my, this mic is widely used in mostly Malaysia hospital. I think uh, a certain center also will be having this monochromatic infrared photo energy. It improves oxygenation and also nutrition related to nitric oxide metabolism. Where uh, and it also promote nerve growth and re-establishment nerve membrane potential that has been reduced by the hypoxic condition associated with the diabetes. And there is one study said that might actually improve the diabetic peripheral neuropathy, not in terms of pain management, but it also improved in terms of skin sensation and also um, further improve our patient's balance. Very good. And then, lastly, we also have uh, NMES. NMES will help in pain management by stimulate a large nerve fibers and might therefore lead to a spinal stimulation that in turn will reduce excitability of small, small nerve fibers. So we will reduce the pain. And for the pain management, now we go for aerobic training to improve diabetes. Here are details about the aerobic uh, training for the patients. Uh, frequency, uh, this is actually uh, recommended by the uh, American, Sport, uh, American College of Sport Medicine and also American Diabetic Association. Frequency, usually uh, three to seven days per week with no more than two consecutive days between bouts of the intensity of the activity intensity we usually uh, we will go from the moderate first which is 40 to 55 59 percent of heart rate reserve or rpe of 11 to 12 only then we further uh, progress to vigorous one which is 60 to 89 percent of the heart rate reserve with the rpe of 
14 to 17. Timing, it aimed for 150 to 300 minutes per week if you are doing moderate uh, activity. If you are doing vigorous exercise, vigorous intensity exercise, so weekly uh, timing should be around 75 to 150 minutes only per week. For type of exercise, you can go for jogging, walking, cycling, swimming, dancing, interval training, or if you do, if you want to go for uh, indoor, you also can do uh, exercise such as cycle ergometer, treadmills, recumbent steppers, and also elliptical trainers. For the progression, it depends on the baseline fitness, each height, sorry, weight, health status, and goals, and gradual progression of intensity is recommended. It is also uh, important to have a medical clearance from the uh, a specialized physician before you engage in the exercise. Other than that, uh, usually uh, physical therapists or physiotherapists need to know the baseline uh, of the fitness level. Usually we will do the automax test or, or other tests to know the baseline before we can generate the exercise program for the diabetic patients. Since Aerobic exercise uh, is quite intense and usually diabetic patients will be taking their medication. We need to know a little bit about medication and the effect of the medication that will further risk of having hypoglycemia. So there is, this is anti-glycemic medication and risk of hypoglycemia with the exercise. If the patient will uh, were having uh, diabetes with the insulin or saponis ureas, there is high risk of hypoglycemia with exercise. Uh, for the maglitinides, moderate risk of hypoglycemia with exercise, and the rest, biguanides, like peptide, peptidase for inhibitor, glucagon, like peptide 1 analogs, and a few others, usually just having risk, uh, low risk of hypoglycemia with exercise. Exercise undertaken during peak effect of rapid acting insulin dose increase the risk of having hypoglycemia. Thus, uh, dose administered within one to two hours before the planned exercise likely will require reduction. The necessary size of reduction in prandial insulin dose varies widely among individuals, usually from 20 to 70 percent, and it depends on on factors such as uh, what type of insulin use. Uh, basically, there is a type of insulin you recover after this, and also what uh, type of exercise or intensity of exercise uh, program uh, for the patient. And the risk of exercise-induced hypoglycemia is lower in patients taking long-acting insulin. Okay, uh, this is actually uh, the action or peak action of insulin uh, after injection, if the patient is having rapid acting insulin, for example, the red one named Lispro, Aspart, and Glulicin, usually the peak action of the insulin is actually one hour after the injection. So one hour after injection, make sure no any exercise given to the patient because it will further reduce the blood glucose. And if we are doing exercise at that time, the patient having high risk of getting hypoglycemia. If the patient having short acting insulin, usually the peak hours uh, or the peak action of the short acting insulin is actually uh, after three hours injection. So three hours after injection for short uh, acting insulin, make sure no exercise were given at that time for the intermediate acting insulin usually around four to five hours after the injection is the peak uh, action for the insulin to work to reduce the blood glucose, make sure no exercise during that time. For the long acting insulin, usually uh, we can proceed with the exercise, but we still need to be precaution. There is low, uh, low uh, 
risk of getting hypoglycemia using basically for uh, long acting insulin. All right, a point to notes, make sure the notes and timing of certain medication may require adjustment to avoid hypoglycemia as I said just now. Caution is particularly important to those treated with insulin and insulin secretor gods. Patients should still be counseled about appropriate recognitions and treatment of hypoglycemia regardless of their medication regimen. So we need to address the patient. They have to know the symptom of hypoglycemia so that they can stop if uh, they experience that. And then frequency monitoring to assess glycemic response to exercise is principal method to determine appropriate adjustment for individual patients. Uh, another point to see is if taking insulin or medication that can cause low blood sugar, which is hypo, blood test 30 minutes before exercise. So if you have a patient who are having diabetes before engage in exercise, make sure to have a blood test 30 minutes before exercise. And then if the blood measurement or the reading is below than 5.6 milliliter millimol per liter, the blood sugar may be too low to start exercise. So maybe you can the patient can eat a small snack contain 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrate, such as fruit juice, fruits crackers or even glucose tablets before begin exercise. If there is around 5.6 to 13.9 millimole per liter, then this is good to go for the exercise and it is safe. Uh, Pre-exercise blood sugar range. And uh, last one, if it is too high, higher than 13.9 millimole per liter, this is cautious zone. Blood sugar may be too high to, to proceed with the exercise. Done with further uh, aerobic training. So, how about weight bearing exercise? Can can or cannot? And does it say? Right. Uh, previously, uh, unloading was recommended to heal wound. Protective footwear was prescribed to help prevent skin breakdown of insensitive feet. And people with neuropathy were advised to avoid the weight bearing exercise. And before 2009, American Association, American Diabetes Association, included that uh, recommendation uh, in the presence of severe peripheral neuropathy, it may be best to encourage non weight bearing activities such as. Uh, swimming, bicycling, or arm exercise because uh, because of the increased risk of skin breakdown and also charcoal joint disruption. But uh, the finding of the study published in Physical Therapy were instrumental in leading to a substantial change in this guideline as the authors concluded that increased weight bearing activity in participants with diabetes and a prior history of foot ulcer is actually do not increase the risk of foot ulceration. And it is demonstrated that collagen fibers have increased diameter after exposure to compressive and shear stresses and are organized and packed into structures that appear to adapt to their mechanical environment. So the paradigm shift represent a true change from the traditional thinking with the new perspective that people with diabetic peripheral neuropathy should be encouraged. So they can do uh, weight bearing exercise to maintain and even increase weight bearing activity rather than to avoid. It appears that appropriate monitoring weight bearing exercise is safe and feasible for this population and lead to positive outcomes. And modest improvement in gait speed and habitual physical activities can be expected after the weight bearing exercise. But there is always a step three precaution. During the weight bearing exercise, additional care is taken to maintain proper foot support. The toes should always touch the floor. Avoid hammering or clawing when possible. The ankles should not be laterally tilted with lateral deviation. So make sure it's in a normal uh, position. Thus, self-perception of the foot and the ankle position 
is stimulated even during the most challenging tasks. So we have various exercise that is it. Yes, it said with precautions. Next is balance and good training strategies. Previous studies uh, reviewed that gait uh, characteristic in diabetic peripheral neuropathy uh, and the effect of various modalities to improve balance in diabetic peripheral neuropathy client. But uh, however, they uh, do not into account balance exercise as an intervention. Usually, patients with DPN will be having weakness in the distal part of the body and it always uh, happens late in the natural history of the DPN. Uh, we increase uh, severity of the DPN. Usually, when we do a Romberg test, there, is, uh, there will be positive Romberg uh, sign and also ataxia may be found due to a weakness uh, in the ankle plantar flexor and also dorsi flexor, the weakness of that muscles. And then uh, this uh, instability will lead to difficulty in maintaining balance and also will affect the gait, of course. And then uh, both will be affected, uh, which, which are static and dynamic balance uh, in DPN. Uh, various factors that affect the balance in this population are the result of significantly impact sensation, proprioception impairment, uh, movement strategy impairment, biomechanical structure disorder, and also usually disorientation. So, general exercise for balance improvement has been shown to be effective in diabetic peripheral neuropathy clients. So, we can proceed with the exercise for the balance. So, always include balance exercise and great training for diabetic patients. Next is a flexibility exercise or we call that as a stretching exercise. Uh, it should be included because usually a diabetic peripheral neuropathy client will address a joint range of motion limitation, particularly in the uh, ankle, hip or shoulder. And a complete musculoskeletal examination by the physical therapist can identify individual needs that should be addressed to maximize joint alignment and minimize movement related injuries. Uh, it, then this exercise also can help joint more flexible and reduce the risk of injuries. So uh, we can start with the gentle stretching with the timing of uh, 5 to 10 minutes will help the body to warm up and also get ready. Uh, for example, of flexibility exercise that can be safely utilized are hamstring stretch, calf stretch, knee to chest stretch, toe stretch, ankle inversion and inversion. Detail about flexibility exercise here with the frequency of two to three days per week and stretch to the point of tightness or slight discomfort timing. So for static stretch can hold for 10 to 30 seconds with two to four repetition of each exercise. What type of stretching that you can uh, using? You can use a whether static, static stretching, dynamic stretching, and or or PNF proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation stretching. Done for the black speed exercise. Now we go for the last part is strength training approach. As for resistance training, frequency minimum of two non-consecutive days per week, but preferably three days per week. Intensity, usually we start with the moderate one, 50 to 69% of one repetition maximum to vigorous one, 70 to 85% of one repetition maximum. How about repetition? So at least eight to 10 exercise with one set of 10 to 50 repetition to near fatigue set uh, gradually progress to heavier weights 
with one to three sets of eight to 10 repetitions. And for the type, usually you can proceed with the resistance machines and free weight machines. So that's all for the strength training approach. Now, as for conclusions, uh, diabetic management is sophisticated and one option that help manage blood glucose level among diabetic patients is being active and doing exercise. Therapists should always be aware that diabetic complications and manage accordingly based on the patient condition. Exercise should be tailored to meet the need of individual. As I can say, each people is different. So everything can be subjective. In a nutshell, it is always important to have a regular physical activity and exercise for good maintenance of diabetes condition along a lifetime. Thank you. With that, uh, I bring back to Mr. Alcosa. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hafiz, for the insightful presentation. Uh, dear viewers, if you have any question for Mr. Hafiz, please leave a comment. Please fill in the survey form, which can be found at the comment section by the end of this webinar. ESET will be awarded. Okay, so currently we are waiting for question from audience. So far, I think don't have any question. Okay. Uh, actually, I got question from my side. <clears throat> so, uh, what are the limitations and associated risk of exercise for diabetes in general? Sorry, Kausa, can you repeat? Okay. Uh, what are the limitations and risks of the exercise for diabetes in general? All right. Uh, thank you, Gosa. Uh, basically, we already discussed uh, a bit uh, regarding this uh, from the previous slide. Okay, but it's very good because uh, these uh, limitations and also risk uh, is actually high in patients with diabetes. The first one is actually uh, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia or exercise-induced hypoglycemia is actually the most common implication and also fear in individuals with uh, diabetes who were taking insulin or insulin secretor uh, such as sulfonin ureas or maglitinides. And one of the easiest uh, and most effective ways is to have uh, adequate and extra amount of carbohydrate consumption before, during, or immediately following the exercise prescriptions. Uh, besides, uh, diabetes patients who are taking uh, insulin, usually preprandial bolus, insulin that were taken uh, before the meal, uh, the doses of the insulin need to be reduced a bit. Okay, uh, and then uh, another limitation is actually heat related illness because they usually a uh, patient with uh, diabetes merited they have a, a problem to um to produce sweat so their heat uh body heat will be spiking so to avoid this make sure uh, to have a well ventilated area do not uh, wear uh, tight clothes and also uh have uh, enough water drink to avoid dehydration. That's it. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Afis, for the very detailed answer. Okay. Uh, I got another question from my side also. Uh, how is physiotherapy helping in reducing diabetes complication? Right. How diabetes will help in diabetes complications? All right, the most uh, complication is actually, as we already said just now, the most uh, common complication is diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Uh, by doing exercise, as I said just now, not, uh, not even uh, doing for pain management using modalities that I have uh, touched uh, just now, I want to go more detail regarding aerobic exercise because this aerobic exercise will further 
improve the condition uh, not just will uh, reduce the will improve the insulin sensitivity in the patients uh, with the diabetes but it will improve in term of diabetic complication for example the diabetic peripheral neuropathy because uh, it will improve the oxygenation to the uh, affected area and further uh, improve the nerve uh, the nerve area that are affected by the diabetes complication. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Hafiz, again for the very detailed uh, answer. Uh, another question, okay, uh, from me, okay, uh, what are the examples of balance exercise that can be administered to diabetic peripheral neuropathy patient? All right. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, basically, it's a very general question. And I think as a physiotherapist um, or a therapist should know basically how to tackle for the balance exercise. If uh, I can say uh, for me, I will assess the patient first using work balance skills. Uh, if the patient cannot perform all the component from the work balance skills, for example, from sitting to standing, uh, uh, turn 360, for example, we can train the patient for balance using the book balance scales component first. And then if there is improvement in terms of the balance, then we can go for the uh, training using a bubble board, bubble board, okay? And then uh, we also can have um, uh, more than that, actually. We, now usually we have a modalities um, instrument assisted uh, exercise for balance then we can proceed also with that thank you okay thank you um Safis, again for the answer i think we got one question from audience okay from uh chu wai hong okay may i know what type of exercise most beneficial in lowering blood glucose level all right. Uh, thank you for the question. It's very, very nice one. Um, from my reading, um, from my studies, I can say there is no one or no complete, no complete one that said a specific exercise will reduce uh, or the most beneficial one will good for the diabetes mellitus. So basically, uh, back to the recommendation from the ACSM also, uh, American Diabetes Association, usually they will come up with the uh, aerobic exercise together with um, combination with the strengthening exercise will have uh, actually the most beneficial effect to the um, diabetic patient. But not even that, basically they already study about uh, high uh, interval, high intensity interval training, HIRT, because um people will just need um exercise for just a few minutes and it's actually safe for the diabetic complication and they can have the same benefit compared to the 30 to 45 minutes of exercise of aerobic so there is actually the exercise actually beneficial for the diabetic patient but there is no one no specific one is the most beneficial and actually, all exercise is beneficial for the uh, management of diabetic uh, complications. Okay, thank you, uh, Safi. So we got, uh, I got one more question to ask. Okay, what are the early signs of uh, diabetes and can physiotherapy help in this aspect? All right, uh, thank you. Um, yes, this is very good. Uh, as a physiotherapy, you have to know a little bit what are the symptoms a uh, patient of diabetic will be having, uh, especially before starting exercise and also during the exercise session. Usually, we need to know symptoms of hypoglycemia, symptom of hypo. Uh, that's why before uh, we can proceed with the aerobic exercise, for example, uh, that we consume lots of uh, blood glucose, we need to check 
for the blood glucose level as a safety precautions. But uh, if uh, something happens, we need to know about the complication or, uh, sorry, the early sign of the hemolytus. Uh, we need to know actually if there is a symptom of a pale face. Usually we can see at the lips, uh, meaning there is one of the symptom of the hypo. Next is a uh, patient usually feeling tired, uh, sweating, dizziness, and also patient of always complain uh, they have dizziness and want to faint. Usually that was red flag. We need to stop the exercise and if there is a fast glucose, usually we will be ready with the sweets give to the patient. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Hafiz. So I think we don't have any more questions from audience. So uh, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you, Safi, for joining us today and providing such insightful information. To our mm -hmm. wonderful audience, thank you for joining us at this webinar. We look forward to your comments and participation at future events hosted by Massa University. Please fill in the survey form, which can be found at the comment section by the end of this webinar. It said, uh, again, will be awarded. In case of any further queries, you can contact us through Masa website or visit our social media. Okay, thank you and have a nice day. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum.